Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Tracy Harris, and this is At Home in My Head, the podcast that explores life in the cottage at Woodland Corners. Today's episode is part of a multi-part series titled Perspectives on Death that examines my experiences with death, both as a religious person and later in my secular life. I'll be explaining the ways in which death has impacted me, and perhaps touch on some responses and reactions that may resonate or offer alternatives to the experiences others may have had. This series mirrors articles from the At Home in My Head blog. A link to the blog series is also included in the description. In the interest of full disclosure, I wasn't planning on including animals or pets in this series, even though a few people asked me to consider it. As fate would have it, one of my cats died after the release of the first few episodes and I decided to address the death of pets. I have to admit, this episode was the most difficult one to record so far. As I wrote the text for the script, I shed a lot of tears. Pet deaths take more of an emotional toll on me than deaths of people, mainly because I acknowledge my responsibility as a pet owner for making decisions that impact how they live and ultimately whether or how they die. Never having children, a pet is probably the closest I'm going to have for direct and total responsibility for the welfare of another sentient being. I take that responsibility seriously, which results in a lot of second-guessing, guilt, regret, and emotional investment. And now, for the next episode of Perspectives on Death, Boo. Boo. Little Boo Berry, Baby Boo, Boo Baby, Mr. Booster, Mama's Big Boo Bear. I'm not exactly sure about the first time I saw Boo. Everywhere I'd live, so many cats. Pets that like to roam outside, strays that are lost or abandoned, cautious ferals nobody can touch. They wander the streets doing the best they can. But every now and then, the best they can isn't good enough. And that was the case with Boo. He was domestic when he started showing up in the dark hours of the early mornings on my front porch. I'd step outside to start my morning walk, and here would come this big black and white tuxedo kitty with four white paws and half a mustache, rubbing my legs and trying to talk. He had a funny sort of almost meow, a quiet, incomplete croak that came out when he opened his mouth. He was healthy enough, so I didn't interfere, probably someone's pet, but I watched and waited just in case. After a while, he quit coming around. I figured he was either curled up on a couch somewhere or lying in a ditch. Seems like it was maybe several weeks later when I saw him again. Not really the same cat, though. His fur was thin with bald patches. His eyes were dull and distant. He was thinner. When I carefully reached out a hand for him, I got back a hiss. Then I noticed something else different, a veterinary ear notch. He was officially an outdoor cat, and clearly he lacked the skills to survive on the streets. I got him into a pet carrier and I took him to my vet, who confirmed that whoever had him neutered hadn't had him chipped, so he was ownerless. He was also FIV positive, but otherwise he was okay. I've had FIV cats before, so I knew he was safe to put with my other cats as long as he wasn't a fighter. I brought him home, I kept him isolated, I slowly integrated him into the family. His new sister Annabelle, a short stocky neighborhood tiger striped feral who hates people but loves other cats, and his new brother Mr. Kibbles, a large silver tabby I'd found as a kitten in a thrift store parking lot, begging an employee for bits of hamburger. The introductions went smoothly. Despite being stressed and sick from living on the streets, Boo wasn't bothered by anything. His passive personality put the other cats at ease. In the days that followed, he formed a strong bond with Kibbles. We called it the kitty bromance. If Kibbles was on the bed, Boo was on the bed. If Kibbles was in a chair, Boo was in a chair. And Boo was just as welcoming to people. Everyone who met him commented on how laid back he was. We had a running joke that you could illustrate all his moods with a single photo of him lying on the rug. This is Boo calm. This is Boo angry. This is Boo excited. This is Boo scared. If he had mood changes, 
they were too subtle to notice. The things I remember about Boo, that scratchy sound that was supposed to be a meow, his gorgeous fluffy white tummy that he loved to let me rub, the way he didn't care when I vacuumed all around him while the other cats shot off into the bedroom in fear, how he let me trim his front claws even though it annoyed him. I loved he would jump up and sit beside me, never in my lap, but he would hug my arm with his forepaws as he fell asleep. Little kitty hugs, I called them. Arm hugs. It took some time, but black and white fur started to fill in the bald patches. He began to put on weight. He became more alert. His big green eyes brightened up again. And eventually, he turned back into that big handsome boy I'd first met before life on the streets had taken its toll. The vet guessed he was about three when I found him or when he found me. So he was probably six, I guess, when a little black kitten showed up on the front porch. Boo was in the middle of an antibiotic course for a mouth infection that resulted in the need for a tooth extraction. He wasn't happy about having to take his medication. The new kitty seemed friendly, but a little skittish. She showed up starving most mornings. I was amazed how much that little thing could eat. Occasionally, she'd come back in the evenings for more, it was October, and I managed to catch her before Halloween, a holiday considered unsafe for black cats. When I brought her home from the spay and neuter clinic at the Humane Society, I stayed with her the first night in the bedroom to make sure her recovery went okay. She ended up being very tame. She climbed up to sleep with me. Her introduction to the other cats went well, except for Boo. The kitten loved Boo and followed him around like a shadow. She was especially fond of playing with his tail. He never got aggressive with her, but he was clearly annoyed. He'd growl at her, get up, and move away. The laid-back cat, who was never bothered by anything, was apparently bothered by the new kitten. I took Mr. Kibbles to a new vet for his annual vaccinations, and I planned to take in Boo when his next checkup was due. But something changed. Boo started begging for food, night and day. It was completely out of character. It wasn't just a little extra food. It was a non-stop ravenous appetite. I googled and found some serious illnesses associated, diabetes and thyroid problems. But he didn't have some of the more common symptoms like increased thirst. I made an appointment and took him in. He was tested on the spot for both issues. It came back negative. The vet told me there wasn't much else they could do, and if I wanted to escalate it, they'd recommend an internal medicine specialist. They suggested it might just be behavioral, and I immediately thought about the new kitten. Maybe I was just reading too much into it, and he was just acting out because of stress. So I took him home, and the aggressive eating continued. His litter habits and drinking still were normal. Then, over just a few days, he stopped eating and became lethargic. Lethargic even for Boo. Since the vet had said there wasn't anything else to be done on their end, I made an appointment with my old vet, who was thorough to a fault, because I knew they'd leave no stone unturned. I won't bore you with too many details of what happened over the next few months, but it was long. It was hard. It was stressful. The Reader's Digest version was that the sonogram showed Boo had swollen lymph nodes and pancreatitis. He also had an infection. We treated the infection to see what that would do for the pancreatitis. We increased the antibiotics. I fought with him to get him to take his medication. He started to miss the litter box and urinate in odd places. We had to adjust the boxes and remove the carpet, which was fine since I'm doing a home remodel. His eating was on and off. He'd start to look better, he'd start to eat more, and then crash and quit his food entirely. He'd get better with the litter box, and then we'd find more mistakes on the floor, sometimes right next to the box. By this time, COVID-19 was in full swing and my vet had a social distancing system. Every time I went back, I had to park the car and call them. A tech would come out in a mask and pick up Boo or give me the new meds or supplements, and I'd be on my way. Owners were no longer allowed to enter the premises beyond the parking lot where we had to stay in our cars. I took Boo back for more tests. His fur wasn't growing back from where he was shaved from the sonogram. They put him on omega-3s to help with that. I wanted to know if the infection was gone. 
I worried maybe the infection from his tooth extraction was never fully resolved. I worried that the new kitten had brought in a pathogen that had impacted Boo due to his compromised immune issues with the FIV. We can run a test on his white blood cell count for about $70. But what if it comes back normal? Then I still won't know what's wrong. Well, he's only six, but we could order a full senior screening. That'll set you back about $200, though. I decided that comprehensive testing had no downside. Whatever happened next, at least we'd have a robust baseline. It was frustrating when all the tests came back normal. The only oddity was a slightly low white blood count, which is not indicative of infection. The vet said the results showed nothing to be concerned about. But my cat wasn't my cat anymore. Whatever was going on, this wasn't Boo. Something was wrong. He was losing weight, even when he was eating. Then he started doing something even more concerning, eating the cat litter out of the litter box. I didn't want him to make himself ill, so every time I saw him do it, I offered him food, including organ meat, because it's high in vitamins. I'd read this behavior, known as pica, is a sign of malnutrition. I was concerned he'd do it while I was asleep and end up making himself more sick. I called the vet who put him on a high nutrition prescription diet and gave me a supplement. I was told to stop feeding him organ meat so they could gauge whether or not the prescription diet was working. They suggested revolution to help with parasites in case anything odd might be going on there, even though there weren't any signs. I pushed back a little because the vet had suggested when I first found Boo that he might be allergic to flea medication because of the balding pattern between his shoulder blades. But I broke down and tried it. Boo lost hair again. The weight loss continued, and now his eyes were getting smaller. I pulled back the lids and they were completely bloodshot. I googled for allergic reactions to Revolution and called the vet to ask if that's what I was seeing. They instructed me to give it a few days. In the meantime, his stomach started bloating. It was the only part of him that seemed to be gaining weight. I hadn't seen him use the litter box to do anything but urinate for about three days. All he did anymore was lay on a towel in a box I'd set up for him near the water dish. I'd set up a box for Kibbles as well, who kept a vigil over Boo. In the mornings, if it was only Kibbles coming to bug me about breakfast, I knew Boo wasn't doing well. If Boo was with him, I'd start to get hopeful. But it'd been several days since Boo had made the journey down the hall to my bedroom. He wasn't even looking at me anymore. He looked past me, unfocused, disinterested in everything about the world around him. All of this would be worth it eventually if it could just be Boo again. But if he wasn't going to improve, I couldn't see any point. I called again in the morning and pressed. He looks like a pregnant, emaciated cow. Something is wrong. The bloating got their attention, and I brought him in that same day. They said they wouldn't be able to see him until later. They were slammed with appointments. I posted on social media, and someone on my Facebook page posted a comment. FIP? Question mark? I looked it up. FIP has two versions, a bad version and a worse version. Both are deadly, and one is just a little more awful and escalates more rapidly. Again, I thought of the new kitten. FIP is a non-lethal coronavirus in cats. No one knows why, but in some cats, the virus mutates into a deadly form and becomes FIP. Had I sealed Boo's fate when I brought that kitten into the house? The call came at a quarter to five, the bloating was fluid in his abdomen. It wasn't urine. It had too much protein. It was indicative of several potential problems, none of which were pleasant. The vet said it looked like FIP. I felt guilty wondering if I'd introduced a kitten into the house carrying a virus that may have caused all of this. There was one diagnosis Boo would have a chance at surviving, but it would require testing. The vet warned me if we went that route, Boo could decline in the few days it would take to get the results back. He was in a bad state. I asked her about the prognosis. She said it wasn't good. Are you telling me it might be time? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. 
I took a deep breath. Okay, then let's do it. She told me they could postpone it and schedule it so that I could be there. I'd always been there to put down my cats, but this time it seemed selfish. I didn't want to make Boo go on in that state just so I could be there when he was put down. I explained to the vet I didn't want to wait. They called me maybe 10 minutes later to tell me he was gone. In the past, I've always paid the $40 disposal fee. In Texas, it's not legal to bury an animal on your property. Not that I'd want to. And I'm not really one for memorials. Usually I get an ornament in the mail with their paw print and the name as a memento from the vet. But the vet informed me that the disposal option was no longer available. I had a choice. I could either take Boo's ashes home or have them scattered at Canyon Lake with the ashes of other cats. I'm not interested in keeping the ashes, but there was something visceral in me that couldn't abide having his ashes scattered somewhere unfamiliar to him, even a beautiful spot on Canyon Lake. I think it reminded me of how I'd found him, lost in a strange place. I associated unfamiliar surroundings with him being lost and afraid and unable to fend for himself. I realized I could be at peace having his body disposed of clinically and unceremoniously, but I couldn't handle knowing his final ceremonious resting place was unfamiliar territory. Boo needed to come home to be buried. He needed to be reintegrated with the place where he felt safe, where someone was there to love him and take care of him. It's about meaning and symbolism. I don't believe in an afterlife. But if we're going to place meaning on his remains, if we're going to say these ashes represent Boo, then he would feel scared and abandoned at Canyon Lake. It makes no rational sense because it's on a level of symbol and meaning, but Boo needs to come home. You'd think that'd be the end of it, but as Boo's situation sank in, I realized I had an unopened prescription bag of kibble and a case of cans I'd ordered from Chewy.com. I also had an opened case of cans I'd purchased from my vet, along with a handful of leftover medications that I hadn't used. I called the Humane Society to ask if they could take the prescriptions and prescription food. They said they could use it. I decided to email Chewy to ask if I could return the unopened food, and if not, I'd donate that as well. The following day, before I left for the Humane Society, I checked my email. Chewy had replied. Hi Tracy, I'm terribly sorry for the passing of your beloved Boo. As pet parents, we completely understand how difficult it is losing a furry friend. I credited the purchase price, which will go back on your credit card within three to five business days. We won't ask for you to send this item back, not in this case. We ask that you donate it to a local rescue or shelter that you may know of. Here at Chewy, we're all pet parents and can completely understand how hard this time might be for you. We know our animals aren't just pets, they're family. It can help to talk to other folks who can relate, so always feel free to reach out. It's so difficult having pets and then saying goodbye. They come into our lives with so much love and fill it with memories. All we can do is just cherish those memories. If there's anything else we can do to help, feel free to reach out at any given time. I was amazed. A few days later, I received flowers and a sympathy note from them. When I posted about it on social media, the comments were full of similar stories of amazing things Chewy's done for my friends who have lost pets. I know this probably sounds like an ad for Chewy, but I'm impressed. I liked them before. I love them now. Customer service on that level deserves a shout out. I took the food and medications to the Humane Society. They were excited to receive them. Again, COVID required me to drop the box at their donation bin and call them to report I was there. I stayed to be sure they were able to collect it. In the end, Boo left a legacy. He paid it forward by helping other cats and kittens in situations just like his, abandoned, surrendered, or found on the streets. All of them are now with people who care and want to help them find new families and forever homes. 
homes where they'll be loved and spoiled, where they can get tummy rubs and give little kitty hugs in return. That's it for this episode of At Home in My Head, exploring life in the cottage at Woodland Corners. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay safe, be well, and never stop exploring.